Hello and welcome to What's Next Wall Street. I'm George Alfredis. And I'm Dave Matthews. And this is a show about stocks, crypto, and the new decentralized financial Web3 world around us. So every week we're here with new information and tips that can help you become a more informed trader. I've got details on the hot new trending products that everybody's talking about, using and also investing in. And today we uncover greedflation. I'll explain exactly what that term means and let you decide for yourself if it's the driving force behind our current inflation woes. And I'm gonna talk to my friend Jenna and her new project, Super massive and how awesome that's going to be for music and letting Gen Z artists create NFT songs on the platform. Sounds super massive. It is. Greg Krause, lead instructor at OptionsPlayers.com, is here to help with technical analysis with fundamental trading knowledge. He really helps us out. Yeah, and we want to hear from you. So email us at WNW at OptionsPlayers.com. Hit us up on social media at the What's Next Wall Street with your questions. And we can also direct you to instructors and experts over at the OptionsPlayers.com webpage to dig into trading fundamentals. Yes, of course you can watch this episode on Options Players YouTube channel or listen to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. And whether you're listening to the podcast or watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, hit the alert button, give us five stars, all that stuff. Oh, I just got off of a full summer of traveling. I was going to say. very excited yes. about this next story. <laughs> American Airlines is aiming to cut flight times in the future with its latest purchase. Now the future is going to be like 2026 or something. But the Texas-based airline is buying 20 supersonic wow. overture planes. How cool are those for those Super of you cool. watching? So Boom CEO Blake Scholl says a flight from Miami to London will be less than five hours. Yes, bring it. Now, United it. Airlines already has agreed to buy more than a dozen of these same jets. Wow. Now, the Overture over jet is projected to fly 1,300 miles per hour. I'm used to doing like 550 myself, so yeah. this is quite yeah. an improvement. That's right. Most commercial planes fly anywhere from 400 and 60 to 575 miles per hour. If you're on so Spirit, it's like 200. I'm sorry. I hope they don't, they're not a sponsor. Oh, my God. Spirit. <laughs> but I'm just saying, did you remember the, do you remember the song Supersonic? Yeah. It's everlasting Beat, Supersonic. Hey, can you do the high-speed rap in it? I bet you can. Um, um, can't so listen, we didn't need research to tell us this, but just in case. Facebook's popularity is dropping significantly amongst teens. In 2015, 71% of kids ages 13 to 17 said they use Facebook more than Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. Now, this is back then. That number is now down to 32%. Facebook has now also taken a backseat to other apps, uh, mainly TikTok, of course. Uh, about two-thirds of teens say they use TikTok. The kids who were 17, though, in 2015 are now in their mid-20s, and they're probably still using Facebook. But today's teens have a much shorter attention span. So that short-term form of video format is right up their little impatient alleys. <laughs> not that I have an impatient no, no, teen no. at home or anything. Focus group, we call that. Yeah. Would you believe my 16-year-old doesn't even have a Facebook page? He it's, doesn't even have it, but he has TikTok and Instagram. It's, it's so funny to watch the, my friends that have kids. Like Facebook is not even on the radar. And this is why Zuck bought Instagram years ago, but they totally missed the mark on TikTok, yeah. and that's why Instagram is trying to be more like TikTok. With the reels, yeah. yeah. And we talked about this on a prior show where the Kardashians want to make Instagram Instagram again. Too I, funny. I think it's our age. I still like Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, so. I want Instagram to be like it used to be. Anyway, Georgia, did you see this? What? Snack stocks are on the rise. Ooh, cool. Although the overall market is down, Coca-Cola is up 10%, Pepsi's up. Hershey stock is up 19%. Even Celsius energy drinks are up 137%. Do you know this? Celsius? Have you ever had one? No. Okay. I'll tell you about it later. So Pepsi's making a $500 million investment in yeah. Celsius. The point is this. People still want their comfort snacks. Mm -hmm. Something about a big old glass of milk and Oreos makes everybody happy. Now I just want an Oreo shake from Jack in the Box. I know, right? So we can chalk that up, I think, to people being on lockdown due to the global pandemic, inflation, recession, Political divisiveness. We just want some comfort. So you, what you do we my, do? You with mean my COVID nineteen? Yeah, no, don't even talk pounds? about it. As in, <laughs> yes. So we snack. Listen, let me tell you something right now. I wake up some nights thinking a robber has broken into my kitchen what? because my husband is the noisiest late night snacker in the world. Teleprompter guy. Yeah. We also have to think about how we consume in the summer. Think about this. We're having parties. The kids are at home from school, eating you out of house and home, and even now. 
that my kids are back in school, they got to have the perfect snacks in their backpack. <laughs> and when they get home from school, they got to have them. So I volunteer at my kids' school. We're talking about Celsius yep. um, drinks. And they sell Celsius. I had never seen it. They sell out by the end of the day. By 3.30, we're out. I'm like, sorry, we don't have any more Celsius. Gen Z loves Celsius, but Monster is still the most popular, followed by Red Bull, Bang Energy, and Rockstar. Maybe, though, Dave, I think it's an age thing. I think people our age gravitate to Red Bull. You know, that's what we knew. That was our first real energy drink. While millennials seem to like Monster and Rockstar because they want to be jumping off the walls. You know what? Just give me a big old cup of joe and I'm good. Is that telling my age? I just want coffee. Just you know, give me coffee. You know, I used to have Red Bull and vodka until Oops. the next morning I'd wake up with my heart beating out of my <laughs> yes, chest. I'm like, yes. no more energy drinks for me. <laughs> exactly. Hey, Georgia, ever hear this saying, misery loves company? Yes. It's kind of like our show. <laughs> well, this is true even amongst traders. If you have spent any time on social media, you'll notice that many instances where losing traders will purposely misdirect or say things in hope of others losing since they too are having a tough run. That sounds like a hater. That's me. Yeah. Well, it's quite sad, but it goes without saying. So maybe you should make sure you surround yourself with like-minded, successful folks like we do, so you don't fall into these precarious situations. The positive reinforcement will go a long way on your quest to sustainable trading. We hope this pro tip finds you and let you stack well amongst those with your right minds. That's right. Yeah. Those people have player hating mm, degrees. No good. I'm all over music today. I'm sorry. All right, so this is the part of the show where we get to hear from you. You can always hit us up on social media at What's Next Wall Street. Comment on our, comment on our YouTube page or email us at WNW at Options players.com. So this first email comes from Andrew D from Options Players Community. Um, Andrew writes, looking at the balance sheet of the Fed, it doesn't look like they have, they've started unloading a whole lot of assets. If the pace of unloading is supposed to increase in September, should we expect a downside in the coming months, especially after this very strong rally uh, when SPY index was at 360? That's a good question. That's a great question. Greg, what do you say to this? Uh, you told me to be quick, and this is not a question <laughs> that I can answer in 10, 15, 20 minutes and have you understand. All right, first take your off, time. <laughs> first off, I want to try. First off, let's understand what we're actually talking about here, okay? So you're talking about the Fed's balance sheet, and they're not going to unload. And what I mean by that is they're not going to sell their assets. And their assets that we're talking about are going to be treasuries, notes, bonds like that, and then mortgage-backed securities. And Yes, mortgage-backed securities is what caused the 2008 crisis. So, you know, why are they buying them? Eh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Now, securities, treasuries, okay, what they're going to do is say, let's, this is not exactly what's happening, but they bought some a year ago. They mature this month. They're just going to not, per, not take that money and purchase more. You get what I'm saying? So instead of selling them they're just getting their money back and holding it so they're not out there like i'm going to sell this i'm going to sell this they're just not reinvesting the money they're getting back on those treasuries okay now they are capping it because some months it might be over that 60 billion that's going to start in uh, september so there you go now let's talk about treasuries and how that will affect us as as people so now you have less people trying to buy something all right. That means the price goes down, correct? So if there's a hundred Louis bags, right, and a hundred people want them, they're going to cost retail. But if only fifty people want them, the price is going to have to come down to get more people wanting to buy them. You got what I'm saying? And yeah. I know no Louis. I know you said Louis, so that I was okay. so that I would understand. Yeah, I get yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. We'll put <laughs> five thousand on there. All right. But that's essentially what's going to happen as the demand goes down the price will go down, which the yield goes up. And when the yield goes up, that means people can now purchase these and make more interest off of them. So you'll see individuals possibly leaving some of their money out of the market and then putting it into bonds because that's providing them a little bit more risk-free money. And it's kind of a balancing act there, right? And the Fed thinks they understand how to do this now after failing miserably in the past. Um, so now they're going to just try to slowly just keep this at 60, 60, 60 until they get to about 
I think in 2017, they said they wanted to get to about $3 trillion in assets, and they're pretty close to $8 trillion right now. So I think they're probably going to try to get to about $4.5. Um, and they probably should go lower, but it is what it is. Uh, but then you have their mortgage-backed securities, which is also a a lot. They probably got, I don't know the exact number. I think it's about probably, let's just say $2 trillion. That's going to be around there. Uh, in mortgage-backed securities. And you're probably like, what's a mortgage-backed security? It's a bond, the same way treasuries is, but instead of being backed by the United States government or the treasury department, it's backed by, you guessed it, your house. Mm. Now, the reason why the government buys these is it's simple. The We wanted to put money back into the economy. Mm -hmm. So who gives out money? Who loans money? Banks do. Well, banks' money, also known as your money that you put into the bank, is tied up in mortgages. So by the government buying these bonds in these mortgages, it gives the banks more money to loan you. Got it. Um, so that's essentially why we do that. So by not purchasing more of those, that makes banks have less money to loan you. So you'll see higher interest rates. In both of these, we've kind of seen it. We've raised interest rates, federal rate constantly but we haven't seen all rates go way up. You haven't seen bond prices just really go crazy. Um, it kind of did, uh, but now you're seeing them go up again. And this is probably what's going to happen um, throughout the year as it slows. It's, I don't think it's gonna be a spike like crazy, but you gotta understand that. And how is that gonna affect the market? Well, they're trying to make it where it will not affect the market, but it's kind of a political thing too. We have a major election coming up and I don't know what's going, what people are going to do, say, or have done to throw this around. So I'm just saying for me to try to explain exactly how this quantitative easing is going to happen and how it will affect markets on a certain stock, that's rough. There's, that's, yeah, it's that's that's, that's like chaos theory. Now, yeah. how is it going to affect bond prices and things like that? Um, I think yields are going to go up. Bond prices are going to go down. Um, okay. So... It, I'm I've been in TTT TBT, which are two short uh, bond uh, ETFs, and they've been doing pretty well for me for the year. Uh, but that's all I got on that one, and I know that was not short, but that's short <laughs> well, thanks, Greg. It. Hey, we got another one from Duron H of the Options Players YouTube channel. He made a comment there, so please do that as well. He asks, when looking to scalp an option on the expiry date, is it better to get into the current expiry date or the next date out? Which provides a better return? So, Greg, this all depends on what the market's doing, right? Well, I mean, uh, first off, I can make this one super quick. All right. If it, the shorter the period, the more return percentage it's going to provide per dollar move. And that's just because you paid less for it because you paid less premium for it. So if the price of a stock moved a dollar and the delta on it was 50, you made 50 cents. But if you only paid a dollar for it, you made a buck 50. But now if it was two weeks long, you might've paid 350 for it. And when it moved, you only made 50 cents. So you made the same amount of money, but you had to put up more for the longer term one because you're paying for the time. Now with that, although it provided you more profit, guess what? It also provided you more risk. So if it went against you, you would also lose that amount. Uh, so there is no better. It's just what you are. If more conservative, go longer, provide more time. If you're a little bit risky, the nearest uh, DTE or date to expiration, uh, that could be your thing. I like to trade a lot on my scalps. I trade almost all options in the nearest DTE. And I know people are going to hate me for that. And then I like to short uh, options about 45 DTE out and then, you know, cover them somewhere around the 20 to 30 to use that theta curve to my advantage. But once again, this is a complex thing that's hard to just teach in a minute or even 20. Greg says it's all about the theta for all about the Benjamins. So if you've got a question, we can probably answer it. If you want some music advice, Georgia can talk about it and I can screw it up too. So hit us up on social media at What's Next Wall Street in the comment section of the YouTube page or email us www.optionspares.com with your questions. Okay, as you gear up for fall, yes, fall is right around the corner. You need people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. LinkedIn is the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people, and it's incredibly easy to use. 
You can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs, then add your job and the purple hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so that your network can help you find the right people to hire. That's right. So simple tools like screening questions make it so much easier to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can really quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and you know ultimately hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? So do yourself a favor. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash WNWS. That's linkedin.com slash WNWS to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, now that the CDC has pulled back all of their prior advice about social distancing and, well, eh, just about everything was wrong, we're ready to hit the world running with music, events, fun. Am I right? I'm right. So this week, we've got my old friend from San Francisco, Jenna Hannon, on the show. She's hanging out in Southern California these days, but she's been a media and tech marketer with 10 years of experience at companies like Uber and even their little eats division, which probably blew up during the pandemic. Jenna, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So uh, did Uber Eats really blow up during the pandemic or had you already bailed by then? I had left. So I left it right before. I left in February of 2020 after four years. Okay. But so, I, I think it was good for them. Not good for Uber. So the core business was not great. Uh, but Uber Eats definitely ticked up. It's good for them to have something to fall back on, you know, since they had like, you know, a nice market cap and such. So what are Absolutely. you working on now? You, you, uh, you've obviously been around the, the San Francisco scene for a while. And what's going on in L.A.? L.A. is good. It's actually, um, I came down for, for a new company I'm working on in Web3, which is music. Uh, L.A. is, as you know, is the, the global center of music, L.A. and New York. Uh, and so it's been great to take my tech background and bring it to the music action here in L.A. Okay, so a lot of artists, you know, like whether it's Snoop or, you know, we covered this for the last year about what they're doing with NFTs and, and locking music into collectibles. And we talked last week about what Steve Aoki is doing with the platform. Tell us what you're working on at, at Supermassive and uh, how we can kind of learn on, in your space. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're building a music collectibles marketplace. Uh, it's kind of like OpenSea, but designed specifically for music. And so what that means is OpenSea is just is designed for digital art. It doesn't support audio NFTs. And so we are building the marketplace of audio NFTs. But we don't stop there because artists need more than just audio. And so every collector can hold a, a, an exclusive piece of audio. It could be multiple pieces of audio. But they can also offer, an artist can also offer events, access to live streams, merch, vinyl, other pieces of the collection that a true fan would want to own. All right. So when I think about assets like this, you've got, um, I don't know, album artwork, cover art. Do you guys host this stuff as well? Like SoundCloud has been a great place for DJs to host sets. Uh, where does this stuff sit in the cloud? Because Web3 is supposed to be decentralized, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, so we, we're built on top of Solana, but we're also super user friendly. And so what that means is we allow a mainstream fan to onboard to crypto. So one of the biggest barriers to music fans today in collecting from their favorite artists is that experience to own a collectible is quite difficult. You have to have a wall, a crypto wallet already. You need to, you need to own crypto, then you go and purchase, then you need to store that. Uh, so what we do is we actually make that experience super seamless and behind the scenes. And so we spin up a custodial wallet on Solana. So a user can come in and buy their first collectible with a credit card. We create a wallet for them. And then from there, we let them plug into the Web3 ecosystem. So there's some complexities there in terms of how we store. So from an audio perspective, we actually do it in two ways. One is we, we do have AWS centralized storage, and that just matters for an artist to know where this exclusive track is held. 
and that's not a place that's going to go down. And then we also do decentralized storage, which is connected to the actual token. And then, you know, what Steve Jobs did with music was allowed us to spend 99 cents to fill up our iPod with music, right? And that was in the era mm -hmm. of Napster and all the piracy. What are you guys doing for the piracy aspect of it? Is it um, does it use like a credential system from the wallet to unlock the music through AWS? Can you need to get into the nerdy stuff for us? Cause we love that on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's how it works. So you need to own the token to be able to access the content. I so there's a technical piece there, but I'll, I'll the, uh, from a high level concept point of view, what's interesting about Web3 that makes this really different is anyone who owns that collectible has no incentive to go and pirate that track or go and share that file because it instantly devalues their collectible. Oh, so that's people... interesting, right. So instead of music being totally commoditized, it's now their music, their certificates, and their, uh, their wall. that's interesting. I, you know, even Steve Jobs couldn't have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he probably, he probably could have. Uh, but that's the, this is what we saw when Web3 started to emerge many years ago, is it's really a different way to own a digital asset. And what we've seen flash forward to today is that just hasn't yet really been utilized in music, but we think music is one of the top use cases. So when we look at when you would need to own a digital asset, we're like in music, in games, those seem like the two places where this behavior is already prevalent. Uh, but on the music side, it's just never really been possible because there hasn't been the tech to do it. Yep. Now, will I need a special player on my iPhone or on my MacBook or Windows PC that has the the authentication in order to unlock the music? How, how do you work through that? Yeah, so that's built into our wallet. So that's what makes us different than the other big exchanges that focus on art is our, our platform and our wallet is focused on audio. And so your token unlocks that audio experience and the player is built into your wallet that holds all your assets. So as, as long as you're in your super massive wallet, you can listen to all the collectibles that you own. All right. And that explains the name Supermassive now. It's coming together. Everything exactly. you need. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. All right. Very cool. So how can people get on the platform if they're an artist or if they want to consume? What's the what's the ways in? The ways in. So for for a user, um, you can simply sign up for a drop. Uh, so like the other Web3 platforms, we do a seven day countdown before the drop goes live. Every drop is limited edition. So you want to get those notifications to know when a drop is live of your favorite artist. And then on the artist side, we have an application process. And that's so that we can work with every single artist hands on. A lot of the Web3 platforms are completely self-serve, and so any artist can join. But for us, we work with all sorts of types of artists. So we have emerging artists on the platform. We also have big artists on the platform that are launching a collection. So every campaign is customized based on the artist. Okay, very cool. Well, we're excited to see how your platform glow, grows. And um, this, uh, you know, the, as we get into assets in the, the digital space, seeing how they can extend into the physical world is what I'm most excited about. So you've, uh, you've got definitely our, our attention here at What's Next Wall Street. What website can they go to and uh, what Twitter account and how do we keep in touch? Yeah, so they can go to supermassive.co. It's supermassive without the E in, on the end.co. Uh, we are on Twitter, we are on TikTok, we are on Instagram. And you can go check out the website, see what artist drops are available and sign up for the latest coming artist drops. All right. And will you have a channel on OpenSea as well? Or is this your own platform so you don't need those guys? It's just us for now, but we do plug into OpenSea. So okay. if you are a user and you collect, you could also go and trade on OpenSea. Perfect. All right, Jenna, good to catch up with you. I'm, I'm sure there's an afternoon surf calling your name right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Dave. I appreciate you having me on. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Bye. Remember this name. Zingo. We're going to come back to it. If you watch the news, I don't have to tell you that over the last 10 years, over $100 billion worth of crypto has been lost or stolen, specifically because of poor key management scams and hackers. That's because a single private key can be lost, hacked, or simply misplaced. Y'all, real talk here. I can't remember where my car keys are half the time. Why would I want a key for my crypto? 
Our new sponsor, the Zengo Crypto Wallet, is a total game changer, bringing wallet security to a whole other level. Zengo is an on-chain crypto wallet with no private key vulnerability, leveraging advanced cryptography called MPC, which until now, has only been available to multi-billion dollar institutions, not consumers. I see why Zingo calls itself Web3's most secure wallet. Look, I have enough stress in my life. I want my crypto wallet to be secure. And with Zingo, I know it is. My Zingo account is secured by three factors. Recovery simple and stress-free. And Zingo is a one-stop shop. Multi-chain support by Trade Connect to Web3 dApps and store your crypto with, well, Sin. Get started at Zingo.com slash WNWS and use code WNWS to get 20 bucks back on your first purchase of $200 or more. That's Z-E-N-G-O.com slash WNWS. Use code WNWS for $20 back on your first purchase of 200 bucks or more. Terms and conditions may apply. See site for details. All right, I say we're going to talk about it. Let's talk about greedflation. Mm. So you don't need me to tell you that inflation is at a 40-year high, but what you may, or actually what may be news to you is that corporate profit is up 25%, and that's a 50-year high. Here's the thing. I know you're about to, you, you and Greg are about to give, give me the business. Bread costs what it costs, okay? And it's a lot more than it was last year, but guess what? My kids still want grilled cheese sandwiches, so I'm not going to stop buying bread, okay? Is the war in Ukraine creating a bread shortage? Not is, for America. Is it a supply chain issue? Not or either. are companies using everything that's going on in the U.S. and the world right now as an excuse to make more money? Listen, before you say one word, companies are not in business to go out of business. I get that. My husband owns his own business. I want him to make a gazillion dollars. I understand. But there are certainly some cases where companies are using inflation as an excuse to raise prices. Case in point, did you see how social media dragged MasterCard and Visa for raising their transaction fees? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think their costs have been affected by inflation <laughs> or supply chain issues. Greedflation has become somewhat of like this great debate with some suggesting that profit maximization creates inflation. It's become politically polarizing as well because, well, this is America, the Dems blame big corporations while Republicans blame Biden. To be clear, though, inflation is happening around the world. So let's discuss what came first, the chicken or the egg, or profit maximization or inflation. What say you, Greg? Um, I say it's excuses all around. So first off, when has corporations never been greedy? It's the whole point to make money, like you said. It's nothing new for the corporation to say, I want to make more money. Um, do I think some companies are doing that? Yes. Do I think they're making it some crazy? No. And you're really talking about what's the senator's name that did it for debit cards, Durbin. So I did a huge study in this uh, in a doctorate for uh, how that affect. And then after Durbin made the rule so debit cards couldn't charge certain fees, they thought, hey, this is going to help the consumer and lower prices. Well, it came out that no, it didn't help whatsoever. Not one store owner, not anyone lowered the prices because they were getting less fees. Those companies, guess what? I guess if you're going to use the same logic, use the previous higher fees to keep the prices the same and make more profits themselves. Everyone is going to go after profit. The big issue for inflation, like you said, was supply was a big, we have some supply issues, government spending. What has changed in the last five years? Government spending, that's what it is. And I'm not hitting Biden for it, so I'm not a Republican trying to blame Biden because Trump spent it, the Fed spent it. We already discussed the uh, mortgage-backed securities and all that stuff. It's just money being spent everywhere. 2020, average income per person went up, plus you had, uh, Stimulus. 2021, you had stimulus, you didn't have to pay rent, and you made more money that year. Income has continuously gone up. I understand inflation's gone up, but so is income. So you have free money being thrown out, and you have all these people just spending it like it's candy. But to be honest, the bill's going to come due, uh, due soon. So, I mean, we'll find out. So chicken or the egg, I I, I mean, I don't get that, but it's definitely <laughs> profit mag. Uh, Maximization always going to be there, all right? Um, but um, if the government stops subsidizing everyone to go purchase more, you probably lose it. Let the market handle it. If 
You stop giving people money, they'll run out of money and they won't buy it and the prices have to go down. If you give everybody money and they want to go buy everything and inflation goes up, don't get mad that the companies want to get it. It's the same thing that happened with our uh, university costs and our schooling. You want to complain about student loans, but you basically gave out free money to go to this and backed all the student loans people and told them they had to give them and now you're complaining about it. It's In the end, it's the government's fault. You know companies are going to be greedy. Hell, you know politicians are going to be greedy, but at least the companies aren't going to, you know, companies are going to be like, I got to make money for me. That's what it is. All right. Well, thanks, Greg. You got something to say? I'm surprised. Well, look, it costs you more money with bread. I've got two boats, three Sea-Doo's, two Porsches, and two trucks. So gas is through the roof. This is you, dude, with the Porsches. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you're the, you're no, the Monopoly I'm guy not, right I'm here. Not made That's money. you. No, but look. It costs me more to fill up at the pump, but I'm also flying around this summer, so I'm not spending money on gas on my own devices, which is nice. But look, if you're you've an also investor- you got the money to go to Italy, to have your boats, to have your Porsches. You know, you're not even who I'm talking about. I don't even know why I asked you. <laughs> I'm not a even... half percenter. Whatever. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. But Listen. look, if you're trading the stock market, you want everybody to be up. So as much as I hate it, it's great if you're trading. Yeah, you're right. You're right. We agree. Uh, thanks, Greg. If you've got a question for Greg or you want to get at Dave or myself, it is very easy to do. All you have to do is email us at WNW at optionsplayers.com and just up on social media at What's Next Wall Street or you can comment on our U Options Players YouTube page. We always use our comments or our questions. We always use it during the show. Yep. You can watch episodes to see us with our smiling faces on the optionsplayers.com YouTube page or listen on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcast. Yes. Make sure you subscribe, hit the alert button so you get current trending info as soon as it drops. So with that being said, I'm Dave Matthews. And I'm George Alfredas. We will see you next time on West Next Wall Street. It's time for me to travel. <laughs>